Welcome. I've been wanting to do a video like this for a while. Let's have a talk about those things that you need to go from point A to B to become a chess master. And we already know a lot of them. And there, there's many, many opinions on what to study and what to do to go from point A to B. I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the other things, the outside factors. And I want to use my psychology and sociology lens that I worked so hard in college to develop in order to talk about some of these outside factors that I think are just glazed over in culture. When we see somebody that is performing at an extremely high level in something, we, we often have a cop out and go, that's talent. Okay, talent definitely plays a factor in anything. But hard work. Yes, definitely, you have to have hard work in order to be an elite in your field. I mean, essentially, master is the starting point. Say that 2200 rating in U.S. chess, for instance, that is roughly the top one percentile in the system. Or at least that was what I was told, is that the reason 2200 was chosen as it was at the time when the rating system, that's that one percentile. So we decide master in that way. Okay, fair enough. What's the other stuff? Well, let's take a look at this article that inspired me to do this video. And it comes from CNN Sports. And how do you become a chess grandmaster? The boss, Magnus Carlsen, is here to tell you. And they have this, this nice little video. And this was published on October 1st. I'll definitely have the link to the article below if you want to check it out. Definitely support yeah, my my muse in this case, for this video. And you can read through the, the article succinctly if you choose to, but uh, I want to hit, hit some of the high notes here. And as we can see, definitely things are popping up for me. I mean, I think this advertising and shopping definitely knows me. Shopping at Belk, I'm looking for that new bag in my life. You know it. Now, the, the shoes make a lot more sense for me. They look kind of, kind of <laughs> oddly shaped. Sorry. I get, get off on tangents like this occasionally. So the number one ranked player in the world, Magnus Carlsen, is going through, and it mostly deals with how hard the work is. And I think it's not only a mentality that you need. You not only need the hard work, talent, it's definitely a factor. And how do you describe talent in different things? Well, you can definitely <laughs> apply that in multiple categories. And sometimes it's genetic gifts. Some people write it off as, as talent. Having an extremely high IQ, that's going to help. Just like in basketball, if you're extremely tall, that's going to help. But how much are the factors that we can control? I'm not here to, to focus on what to study because we know from psychology that 10,000 hour rule to mastery it holds up pretty well what to study that's definitely a topic for another day but what's what's one of the things the article says that you need a spark of ambition Carlson has early memories of dedicating hours of practice to the sport yeah no doubt in order to get good you're going to need hours and hours and hours of working on the craft in order to, to get there. You're going to have to analyze your mistakes. You're going to have to really focus on why am I making cognitively the mistakes that I'm making and try to fix those errors in logic. Growing up, I always had to play stronger players than me. And that's, a, that's an extremely important point. Because if you're working and you're constantly setting the bar higher, that's an important part of growth. And we're going to get back to, to that point in a moment when I, I do my adding to the article, so to speak. So we'll keep that highlighted and we'll, we'll come back. And now the next one is, is chasing a coveted prize. And it's always nice to have that, that dangling carrot off in the distance that you are working towards. Because personally for me, I grew up in Southeast Alabama and I remember when I, I first started competing 
I mean, I was immediately taken to it. And in the Antics, the Alabama Chess Magazine, they had a top 100 list posted. And this was long before U.S. Chess had any, any sort of uh, search feature where you could easily find the top 100 list. And it definitely wasn't actively updated. So using the top 100 list, I would look up all the players, see where they were at, see where they were playing, understand rating changes, because I had a goal in mind that I wanted to get on that top 100 list. And then I, I had it on the door in my bedroom. I was working to get to top 50, then top 10. And they were major milestones for me, and I felt really great about it. And then each 200 points, you get get a new new class title. And I remember 1600 is class B. So I remember just being in the car, you know, I got my B. I, I was just excited. And each one, I remember the tournament. I remember the excitement knowing, breaking through to the next level, 1800, 2000, and then finally 2200. And it was years and years of work to go from point A to B and finally get that master title. So playing without a goal, definitely chasing a prize, you, you got to dangle that carrot. Otherwise, I don't think you're going to have the same motivation as someone who is setting those incremental goals and working towards it. Of course, they're coming back to practice. We got it. You got to work really hard, as we see Anish Giri, a boss in his own right. Maintaining equilibrium. For others, knowing they have the ability to become a champion feels instinctive. And maintaining an equilibrium, definitely important. We all know what it's like to borrow a term from poker when we go on tilt. It's hard to focus. If you're angry or upset, I mean, imagine for the non-chess players, if you have to take an extremely long and difficult test, how much harder would the test be if you got a toothache? How much harder would the test be if you recently suffered the loss of a family member that was close to you. These extra things affect us tremendously. So maintaining an equilibrium and choosing tournaments to play in, when to play and when not to play, is also a part of success that I think is definitely written off I remember years and years ago, uh, Nigel Short was playing in a tournament, I believe in Canada, and had a horrendous result. I mean, Nigel Short being a former world championship candidate and played a match with Kasparov, he just tanked his rating in, in a tournament. And when I was reading the article, the thing that stuck out to me is he, he had agreed to play in the tournament long in advance and needed to have some serious dental work done, and he was in pain all throughout the event, and it was clear that it was affecting his play. So I feel that they've got a strong point here in maintaining equilibrium, as a lot of chess players have that staying in shape, have an exercise routine, eating certain foods. That's part of the process. A lot of people go, well, why do you need to be in shape? To... Like one of my friends gives me crap about this all the time. So like, why are you going to the gym? So I need more energy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but when I'm competing with people half my age that have boundless energy, I need to be able to calculate for long periods of time because there's many different types of fatigue. Everybody knows the physical fatigue when you worked all day, you, you cleaned, you did everything feasibly possible, try moving into a house. You're going to sleep well that night. I sleep like a baby after a tournament because I'm giving 100% mental effort and mental fatigue can put you out so much harder <laughs> than physical fatigue. So you need energy and staying in shape, more oxygen to the brain, more thought. So that that's that's kind of a, an extra tick on the process that I, uh, I don't know of many guys in the top 10 that aren't physically taking care of themselves and it's part of the process. And you can definitely in Google look up like Kasparov working out. You can see him pumping iron back in the day and stuff. Important process. You have to really 
love the game. I think this is another strong point by the article, is if you're not loving it, how can you compete with someone else who, who does? And that might be an oversimplification, but there is sacrifice to playing chess. Uh, <laughs> you have to, I mean, taking an, an average adult, for instance, you work all week, chess tournaments are typically expensive to go to, where you're having to pay an entry fee, you're typically having to stay in a hotel for a number of nights, and you're thinking as hard as you can and playing as hard as you can in games all weekend to go immediately back to work. And most people don't make money playing in tournaments. There's a select few who make a living doing it. So you're paying money to exhaust yourself when you're probably already exhausted with your normal work work life and schedule. So yeah, <laughs> you, you really have to love the game in order to dedicate yourself to it. And they talk about the, these different grandmasters and their road to success. Now, this article is pretty solid with a number of the points that they give. But the thing that stuck out to me the most, and let's come back to my highlighted point. Growing up, I always had to play against stronger players than me, and it's so important to be able to do that because if, say, you are working out on a regular basis and you're using the same weights, and if you're looking to just maintain, that's fantastic, but in order to grow, if you're looking to bulk up, you need to get heavier over time you get stronger over time. But if you're doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, well, Einstein had something to say about that. So your geographic location is one of my markers for this because Southeast Alabama, typically I had to drive at least 90 minutes to go compete in a tournament. You are required to have a hotel stay and the prize fund is so minimal, you need to win the tournament in order to break even or maybe get a hundred bucks for spending all weekend. Again, you gotta love it. Uh, you're, not, you're not making money doing this. So, as a young person, where's that coming from? Because the young people definitely are the ones who have more time to work on chess and dedicate to chess. So that comes from the parent. Parent support is probably the most significant bullet point. I can say when I've put together teams in the past and have been coaching students, I know immediately, based on parent support, whether or not the child can be successful. You can have an extremely talented child, but if they can't make it to tournaments, they can't prove it. They can't get the practice necessary. If you don't have a strong financial background, it's, it's very difficult. So I think Honoring parents, I mean, I, I definitely would not be sitting where I'm at, and you guys probably wouldn't be listening to me had it not been for my mother taking me to so many tournaments when I was a teen and the support that she showed uh, 100%. And my father was always supportive as well. You have to have that strong support system. That's, that's one of my bullet points. And... You've got to be able to work through those times too because there were years that I was close to making master and couldn't get over that final hump and it was very difficult and I had so many people telling me, close friends and family members, they go, well, it's making you sick. Why don't you quit? And sometimes you need to prove something to yourself. So spark of ambition, you got to want it and you've got to be willing to sacrifice to get it. And if you're not willing to sacrifice, I honestly do not believe that it's a possibility. You can only have so much talent and so much hard work, but having the support system and being willing to sacrifice things that other people enjoy and take for granted, you're going to have to do that. So backing this up a bit, I remember having a conversation once with a national master from New York, and 
we were having a discussion about where where it's more difficult to become a master. And it's like, oh, well, you know, you get powder puff pairings, you get to play the the same people over and over. And okay, well, I have one tournament a month on average in Alabama that I could compete in. In a four game tournament, I'm having to play two games where they don't even count because I outrate my opponent so highly. And then the last two games of the tournament, assuming that I won, I'll finally get to maybe play one other person that's similar in rating. If you lose, you lost six to 10 points for the tournament. If you win, you're up 10. So as a 2150, you've got to beat somebody who is preparing just as hard as you are, trying to make master. And it's, you know, sometimes you trade hits. I win this weekend, two weeks later, you beat me. And someone has to get better and something's got to give in order to break through to the next level. And without stronger players, as Magnus says, to compete against, it's very, very, very difficult. Whereas, say, in New York, if you, you can pick out one chess club, the Marshall. How many events does the Marshall have in a week and how many Masters are there? How much opportunity is there to play casual pickup games with Masters? How many Masters are in New York? Because there was one in Alabama when I was coming up, and he rarely played. So big difference. You have to have quality competition to play against, and that comes to geographic location, financial opportunity, opportunity overall. Because even in my current situation as a national master, if I got hungry and I wanted to go compete in tournaments, I fully support and absolutely love what the Charlotte Chess Center has done. They provide norm opportunities for Americans, and that really didn't happen too much before they started doing it on a regular basis. So much love and respect to them. But if I'm factoring in the cost, it's difficult to justify. Because if I'm factoring in flight from Florida to, to the NC, all right, let's, let's say it's at a time of year where I can get a reasonable ticket, we'll say 500. I'm looking at a, I believe, a $900 entry fee. And then if I'm lucky, I can get a hotel at $100 a night. And I'm probably going to need to be there because they're normally nine round tournaments for 10 nights at least, maybe 11. So you're looking at a pretty significant investment to compete. And I haven't seen what their price structure is, but I'm assuming with so few players that it's going to be the top three players. And... I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm not exactly in form and can't really compare myself to a player that would be in an IM Norm tournament at this time. So I would probably be 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 on, on the list of players. So finishing top three would be a pipe dream. So I am investing, what, 2500 more in order to have the opportunity to go get my teeth kicked in. And you can understand... From that perspective, why a lot of players don't go further. So you need financial backing. And I think that's going to be the, the final kind of kind of point, because I don't want to belabor this too much. As recently, I was reading on forums, and I, I, I'm friends with a lot of chess players and chess personalities in the community on Facebook. And I'll, I'll see these kinds of conversations going on. And when now Grandmaster Mishra got his title, that was some controversy and Twitter post and things. And of course, when someone becomes the youngest Grandmaster ever, everyone takes attention because it's a significant accomplishment and congratulations, uh, sincerely. But one thing stuck out to me because... Dad was quoted as saying that the cost of him getting the Grandmaster title was nearly a quarter of a million dollars from coaching, travel, etc., etc., etc. That is a tremendous sacrifice. A tremendous sacrifice. That's uh, a college education. So 
that one's hard for me to justify. Will it work out in the future? Potentially. There's a lot of opportunities to make a living in chess that stands outside of competition. Maybe he'll become one of the top players in the world. And yeah, you win the U.S. championship a few times. You win a few major tournaments. You could definitely make a dent in that investment to go from point A to B. But let me know what you think in the comments. What are the essential things? What are, what are your top five that you need in order to become a chess master? I just wanted to, to pose this type of argument that a lot of the time we, we focus only on the fact that people have to work hard. And they go, well, there's a lot of opportunities to play online. That, that's, that's changed things. You can just play online all the time. Oh, yeah, you can play all the blitz you want. That's, it's very helpful being able to play against strong players in Blitz. You can tune up your openings, but Blitz can ruin your game if you play too much of it. Ruins calculation. You don't have the patience and effort anymore. I've seen it happen to many players, including myself, when I play too much Blitz. You quit calculating. So, and you go, we'll play longer games online. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and just uh, hit that elephant in the room of cheating as well. Once you get to a certain rating category, unless you know the person you're playing against and they have a title, I'd give it at least a one in four chance that the person's using assistance. The longer the time control game online, with no real consequences, they can just create a new account, they're going to cheat. But another topic for another day. Back to the point at hand. You guys tell me in the comments, what, what are the top five most essential things to become a master. Hopefully I've, I've hit some of them in this video and I've given you an idea of the type of support you need. But uh, yeah, hard work is the thing that's always focused on in all these. But uh, how often was Magnus Carlsen's dad at tournaments? That's probably a good place to start as well. Hmm. Hopefully you enjoyed this as uh, it's just been something on my mind that I wanted to share. Thanks.